Wonderful. Thank you all for inviting me. You know, I came to this symposium, it's got to be more than five, six years ago now. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And I'm not sure why I've never come back, this, but it's, I guess it's places. It was in Northern California, somewhere near Santa Rosa, I think. Uh, so it was an easy trip for me, but I'm very glad to be here. And thank you to uh, Mercy who asked me to, um, to come and I didn't really know what I was doing. So I, I figured this out just fairly recently, but let me explain the logic of what I'm making and what I, I found. Um, two different recipes, both of which were kind of perplexing and, and unusual and, and original. Um, one of these came to me by accident. The um, Wiley corporate, you know, publisher, Wiley and Sons, is trying to make a database of uh, manuscripts available for students for like primary research and things like that. And they, they're, they're trying to compete with Adam Matthew, who also has stuff. And they sent me this, um, a couple of manuscripts to look at as sort of samples for their new site. And one of them just struck my eye because it said medical culinary miscellany manuscript, 16th century. And I'm like, oh, look. And the first page is for gout. The second is for dropsy. There's a couple of, and what, what seems to have happened in the manuscript is that there's stuff in Gothic that is definitely early 16th century, I think, medical recipes. And then there are spaces. Someone went back in the book, filled in those spaces with other medical recipes. And then toward the very end of the book, a third hand or maybe even a fourth comes in and adds culinary ones. So, so there's only maybe, I don't know, 10 recipes in the whole book. There's one for heart's horn jelly. There's one for marmalade, things you, you'd find in medical texts. And then I saw to make Portugal cakes. <laughs> what? Why is this here? You know, next to how to, you know, cure scrofula. So, so I figured... Let me try and uh, make this um, in the manuscript itself. I'll show you what it looks like. I'll just, I'll hold a picture of it up um, because it's in uh, Elizabethan secretary hand, which is, you know, you have to sort of know paleography to figure that out. Once you do, it's, it's not hard at all to read, but that was half the fun was, you know, transcribing it and then, then figuring it out. And, and I have to admit, I didn't really understand what was going on until this morning, but I looked at it again and I'll explain why. So the second one is a little um, uh, easier to find. This is from the uh, proper new book of cookery, which is the 1640s at the very end of the uh, reign of Henry VIII. And I was talking about this recipe um, in um, the, uh, at, at the Getty Museum just uh, about a month or a month and a half or so ago. And that recording will actually be released very fairly soon. So I'll, I'll let you, I'll share that with you when it's available. But I was talking about the blancmange there and they um, cooked all the other recipes that I was talking about except that one. So I kind of wanted to do it because it's really weird and unusual and unlike other blancmange recipes entirely. But let's start with the Portugal cakes one. So let me just give you an idea of what the manuscript looks like. And I think you'll be able to see just that this is a page out of it, that some of the pages are capitals. It's in a, the secretary hand. This is where the, the recipe for the Portugal cakes comes in. And I'll show you, I just blew this up. Um, I know I could have shared the, the screen, but this is, this is just as easy, I think, because you, you're not gonna be able to read it all anyway. But just so you can see what the handwriting looks like. It's a, it's a beautiful but messy uh, kind of um, uh, secretary hand. So let me read it and then we'll go through it. And, it's, and you'll see why the surprise sort of hit me this morning. So it's to make Portugal cakes. And remember Portugal, the Portuguese, um, um, most people that wouldn't know this are really the sort of source of uh, so many different types of pastry, puff pastries and, uh, you know, the pastel, the nata and things like that, flaky pastries. Portugal was known for that long before France um, was. So, so, this, so there's only one word which I wasn't sure of, but I'll, I'll read the transcription. So to take, take half a pound of fresh butter, and I think it says fresh, the, the, the title comes down and swoops in and it's sort of messy, but fresh butter, work it well, then work it over again with rose water, then take half a pound of Corinth, that's raisins, of course, raisins of Corinth, uh, clean, washed, picked, and dried. Thankfully, we have seedless, so I didn't need to do that. Um, half a pound, so this is just ordering, you know, giving you the um, ingredients. So there's the, the raisins. Um, half a pound of fine flour, dried very well. I don't know why the flour would have been wet in the first place, but there you go. And half a pound of loaf sugar. And then the, the um, author, or transcribed, whatever, um, crossed out some stuff because they made a mistake and then it goes on. Um, beaten very fine, the loaf sugar you want to beat very fine because remember it's going to come in a cone and scrape it off and pound it. And uh, two, two whites of eggs beaten well together, three yolks, 
two spoonfuls of rose water. And then what, what becomes unclear is that the whole that so far is the ingredient list, but it's written in prose. And then the recipe actually begins um, to um, two spoonfuls of rose water, mix the flour and loaf sugar well together, sift them through a sieve till all run, then make a paste or pudding thereof. And when they're all wrought together, hour or more, and I think we'll be able to pull it off today, right now. Um, put it in tin pans, which are well buttered. That's what I've got here, these little tin pans. And when the paste is in the pans, take two pieces of loaf sugar, rub them together over every pan until they'd be covered with sugar and then set them in the oven. And what's interesting, it says, um, but do not stop the mouth thereof. They will speedily be baked, set up your oven, a lid a little while, after the setting in. So, so he's leaving the, put, putting them in, or she or she, it's putting the cakes in with the oven open. So it's a cool, it starts hot and then it cools down. And I'll, I'll try to replicate that with my, well, my oven right here. Um, so having read this and saying, okay, well, first of all, there's measurements, right? Everyone thinks there's no medieval or Renaissance recipes with measurements, very precise. But looking at it, I think, oh, there's a half a pound of butter, a half a pound of flour, half a pound of sugar. <laughs> It's pound cake, of course. It's exactly pound cake, and it's and I, I would never have suspected a pound cake to go back that many, you know, hundreds of years. But it does. The only real difference is the flavoring with rose water, and the um, and the raisins. But I think it should be a really fun one. And by cakes, remember, they don't mean cake a large cake you slice. They mean little cakes like cakes and ale. Shall there be no more cakes and ale? Because thou art virtuous, as Toby Belch would say. So I brought my slave boy today. This is uh, Chris Martin, who is uh, my pal, who's uh, said he's going to help me with this. So he's going to work this butter uh, together and add just a little rose water to get it going. Um, and then I'm going to uh, sift. I don't. I don't even think we need to sift the flour and the um, and the uh, sugar together. Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, go ahead. If this question is just shoot at me. Okay. Just, so the first question was actually, it might've been uh, something that was coming from, not from this specifically, but there was a question of, did you know what in Lever Fort, do you know what the, a reference to common powder, what would be in common powder? Yeah. The Lever Fort, I, I translated. It. Oh yes. Okay. <laughs> Boop. There you go. Yeah. Um, it was a long time ago, but so I think, there is a reference in there for poudre douce and poudre four. Uh, poudre common, I think it was something like cinnamon and sugar and pepper and ginger, I think. Um, because it was one that had no darker spices and then one that had the hotter spices, you know, the uh, cloves and nutmeg and things. But um, I can. it's in certain it's in. Um, okay. I can. It's it's Flita. Um, I, I searched the index. I've searched there. It's it says common. It's for cabbage hearts, and it calls for common powder and salt. Common powder is not called out in the index, and I can't find it anywhere else. It's not in the list of spice mixes. <laughs> I couldn't tell you because if because if it's not indexed, then we didn't try and figure out what it was. I guess. Um, is it, if it's in the, it, well, you know, what's really strange sometimes when you do these translations, um, the first half was done by uh, Tim Tomasic, the second half was done by me, and we translated some things differently in different, you know, sort of turns of phrase, and luckily we had Tom Jane, who was the editor at, uh, well, the owner then of uh, Prospect Books, who knew, knew um, 16th century French as well as we did, so <laughs> he, he corrected a lot of stuff, but I guess that's one thing it slipped our minds. So anyway, let me get back to this recipe. Oh, okay. Um, Do you have time so, for a second question? A cup, less a cup of flour. I've actually cut this in half because I don't think, I didn't think I, I would need that much. So here's a cup of flour, flour and a half cup of sugar. Um, and then I'm going to pretend to sift these and just work them into the work. Did you work that up well? It stirred up, okay. Yeah, right. I mean, it's cream. Okay, perfect. Let's start with okay. then, and then the eggs. And the reason this is really very funny. So just by chance, I bought eggs that have double yolks. So I'm getting three yolks and two whites exactly as the rest of the call for. Um, <laughs> nope, okay. perfect. Look at that. Three yolks, two whites. <laughs> with two eggs, which is fun. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Um, so Let's, uh, let's get those in the oven. Um, just, just push that all around. Actually, let me, I'll do it here. 
And I think also, um, paste da, 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 two, two spoonfuls of rose water. So I'm going to add in, I've already put in two more spoonfuls. Yeah. Good. I like the rose water, very strong. Okay. And sugar and cream. Give me, give me the spoon. See this? I'm just working that in. I'm going to add the eggs. This is see what I'm doing here. This is called a stand mixer. Get it? <laughs> I just thought of that. It's very silly. Okay, because I'm not. I should put it down somewhere. But anyway, let me mix it. Hang on. I'm going to set it together. People often ask me about this absolutely beautiful Mayolica bowl and I often use, um, it's melamine. So in case you're wondering, worrying that I'm gonna crack it or something by being violent with it. It's, uh, it's my everyday mixing bowl, works fine. Okay, there goes the flour. And here goes the raisins. And it says, remember, put some sugar on top. So I think that's gonna crystallize a bit. And I think, you know, I like using the refined sugar, but I think I'm gonna use some slightly browner sugar just to make it, I don't know why. They of course had white sugar then too. And I think I'm gonna use half of these um, raisins of Corinth. You know, we, you could buy them today, they're called Zante currants. And I'm really never sure why the word current was adopted because they're the size of little, you know, current currents, which are a totally different plant. But they often call them raisins of the sun or raisins of Corinth. I don't know whether they actually have anything to do with Corinth in Greece, but they might. A little more. Okay, so this is just going to go into the buttered things. And they should be done. I don't know. We'll see. It doesn't doesn't have timing on it. Or heat, obviously. Okay, good go. So um, I'm putting these in the oven right here. Oh, I didn't put the sugar on. Hang on, I will do that right now. Okay, that should work. All right, to the next one. I think I'm going to give that 15 minutes just, just to see. I think that should be okay. Good. We didn't need it a whole half an hour, obviously. Uh, do you have time for taking another quick question oh, from the chat? Uh, the question was regarding the hand that that recipe was written in. The uh, question was, was uh, Secretary's Hand a standard script known by uh, all educated people in 16th century England, or was it reserved for something specifically for those with clerical or secretarial education slash background? That's a great question. The, um, the name of it belies its use exactly. It's not a, a hand just for professionals. Um, this is standard handwriting. No one uses italic yet. Um, no one uses, unless you're like working in the courts, that there are court hands, chancery hand, and there's a, ch a hand for the exchequer. There's Gothic black letter, you know, hand, but secretary hand was the hand that everyone used. Um, and it's it throws you off because there are letters that are made totally different than today. E looks like 
looks like an O, like looks like a weird O. R's are made different. Um, the G THs always throw people off because it swoops all the way down and then crosses over. So it's it's something that's not really hard to hard to learn. I learned it um, at the Folger Library when I, I was actually worked there as an undergraduate. And the weirdest thing happened. I was there talking a couple of years ago and I had to go in and get a new library card. And there's this woman standing next to me. This is Letitia Yandel, who taught me how to read this hand. And she said, yeah, I'm coming in to get my new thing. I hadn't seen her in 35 years. <laughs> she was like standing right next to me. Really, really strange. Okay, so the next recipe um, is uh, comes from the, uh, it's to make blue manger, B-L-E-W-E, -E, uh, uses this capon. And as you guys know, the blamanche is a, recipe that's changed so much over time and place. Um, leave that up, don't, don't bother cleaning it. Um, and the, um, the original, the, I mean, the earliest ones are in the earliest medieval cookbooks, you know, the libellus or what, what they used to call harpestrang as, as a, a blamanche. And normally it includes almond milk, that's sort of the signature flavor. And that's the only thing that kind of links the original recipes to the modern ones, which are a sweet almondy, pudding, you know, made with almond flour sometimes or almond milk and gelatin sometimes. It's, you know, it's a dessert now. There's no such thing as dessert, obviously, back then. But the, the dish does still exist in Turkey, right? There's the, what's called the tavuk gokshu. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but in Turkish. But but basically, as long as you have almond milk, um, uh, capon, it's usually capon, sometimes chicken, for Lent it could be fish, and um, and rice flour is the thing that, that elides it. Now, what's weird about this one is it calls for rye flour, and I'm not sure whether someone misheard it and wrote rye, but you know, it's but it's printed in there, so I think, you know, we might as well, um, you know, see what what it looks like and tastes like. And there's no almonds in it at all, so that's even stranger. Instead of almond milk, it's got um, cream and uh, milk in it. So I was just sort of interested in seeing how this whole thing worked. And what's also very in interesting and unusual is the blanche is usually, um, you know, even with a spoon. Um, this is let chill and then sliced and served like that. So I think in the end, it's going to look sort of like, I don't know, like a, like a, a scrapple or something. You know, it's going to be square slices that, that are chilled, sort of like a chicken pate, I guess, if you want to think of that. But it does have sugar in it, so it's sweet. So let me read this to you, because this is also really a bizarre recipe, the way it starts. And um, it says, take a capon, and I did actually get a capon. It was one on sale at the, at the store and I, I nabbed it. Uh, take a capon and cut the brawn of him, the brawn is the flesh, alive. Now, how do you do this? I have absolutely no idea. And I actually have, there are three chickens that live about 10 feet in that direction at, at my neighbor's house. And I was tempted to like, and they know me. So I was tempted to just pick one up and go, okay, let's take the flesh off alive. I didn't do that. So, you know, that would just sounds horrible. But, uh, but here's where it becomes really confusing. It says, take and parboil the brawn till the flesh come from the bone. Now, if you had taken the flesh off the live chicken, there wouldn't be bones, right? So what I assume this actually means is take it apart, leave all the organs and skin and feathers and everything, and then parboil it. And then when the skin flesh comes off the bone, then we proceed with it. So let me continue reading it and we'll do it. I'm just gonna uh, reheat my um, water right here, whatever lights. Got it going. I've just got a very big, big uh, stop pot right here that I'm gonna uh, poach it in. And you know, that's sort of a typical medieval procedure is you use two different methods. You, you parboil something and then roast it, migroust, or you roast it and then boil it. So this is, this is parboiled, taken off, and then shredded in the most absurd manner you could possibly think of. So, so let me, I'll read it to you. So um, dry him as dry as you can in a fair cloth. We'll do that, we'll dry it off. And then take a pair of cards and card him as small as is possible. Now, card, you know, what they're talking about there is for carding wool, right? They're, they're these little sharp things that you um, rub the wool through to get all the dirty stuff out. So I thought at first, let me try and make a set of cards with nails. And these, these actually, these might work. I don't know. They don't, they don't pass through each other very evenly because they're sort of randomly nailed in. But maybe I'll be able to shred it with these. Let's see. 
these were fun to make in any case. I mean, they're great back scratchers, <laughs> but ouch. Um, but the, uh, but I don't know whether these are strong enough to actually shred chicken, but we'll try. I mean, both, both of us will, I, I actually bought two sets. They're only like, like 10 bucks. Um, so, so let's get the cape on. And what I'm gonna do just over here is I'm gonna pull the um, cape on, uh, apart. I'm gonna cut it up into pieces and um, I'll, you know, I'm gonna use, I'm basically making half the recipe. So I'm just gonna use the chicken, the, the uh, capon breasts and cut the recipe in half just because I, I thought I'd make soup from the rest of it. So um, thank you, lovely, lovely. So this is Minoa capon. I think it's the only brand I've ever seen actually it comes from South Dakota. Um, and my supermarket carries it at Christmas. No one buys it, they freeze it and then they put it on sale and I buy it. But <laughs> this is what happens with the geese often also. So you all know the capon is a castrated um, male uh, rooster, which gets bigger, but the, the texture of capon is really completely different than chicken. Chicken is kind of, this is much more stringy and needs to cook a lot longer, um, which is something I like. I think that's, it's, it's a, kind of a really pleasant texture. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the breasts off of this if I can find them together um, and just poach it. They're, they're pretty big now that I'm looking at it. Um, and I'll use the rest of it for, uh, for making a stock. You know, there's a very, there's a classic saying in Italian that if you want to call someone really stupid, it's someone who doesn't know how to make a broth from a capon. <laughs> this is apparently the easiest thing in the world to do. So um, I think in the original recipe, they're actually using the whole herd, but most, Blamanche recipes only call for the breasts. So let's just. Parboil this. Okay, and I'm going to take the skin off too. Why not? You don't want that, the final product. Okay, so look at these two. They're pretty big. <laughs> this is a monstrous piece of chicken breast. I'm just going to put it in here. Let's time it maybe three or four minutes. Let's see that. Um, this thing I'll save for the stock. You know what that will be for dinner tonight? <laughs> Probably a noodle soup. Um, let me just wash this one off too. If you have questions, go ahead and shoot. If anyone does, because I'm just going to wash this. Give me a second. So it was very funny. You know, I did this whole series of um, cooking, a whole cooking show for the great courses. It was right here, you know, in this kitchen and pretty much, and, and someone wrote a review and said, oh, this guy doesn't ever wash his hands. It doesn't wash the board. And I kind of wanted to say, you don't think that they actually cut that stuff out. You want to wash someone, wash their hands every two minutes, which of course I did, but uh, sometimes people, So what are we up to now? Not quite there yet. It looks really nice. It looks like, here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. It looks nice and white. It's lovely. Just give it another couple of minutes. I should get my fair cloth. Does that count as a fair cloth? It'll have to for the moment. Okay. Yeah, modern chicken breasts are massive. I mean, even compared to the chicken breasts of the 1950s. They are, you know, and I buy a chicken breast. It usually weighs a pound. And that's me and my kid for two meals. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of food on there. Um, yeah, I, I consider each breast half to be two, ser two, two servings, two people, because they're just, just so huge now. It absolutely is. You know what else I find really perplexing is since, the, um, since COVID, the price of chicken has like doubled. You can't buy a chicken for like less than $15, $20 now, in my supermarket at least. I used to be able to buy one for 10, maybe go on sale for a little less, but like it's just, just and, and what's weird is that other, the parts are cheaper, which also makes no sense. It would be cheaper for the, the, I don't know. So this is not quite there, but I'm gonna let that go. Um, let me just clean out this stuff, get this out of the way. I am going to need sugar again. Um, so, you know, it's got sugar in it. Amylized flour. And 
let me measure those out now that I've got it here though. So I've got um, for the two chicken breasts, I'm gonna use a pint of cream, a cup of rye, um, and a pint of milk. Regarding size of chickens and chicken breasts, uh, one of the things I found is if I shop at the one of the local halal markets, I can find small chickens, like under three pound chickens, which are more like the chickens I remember seeing in the 60s and 70s. Yes. Uh, yeah. But uh, no. this, this is, you know, I live like half an hour away from a major Arabic speaking community. There's grocery stores there and they sell chickens that are under three pounds. So I go there every so often and buy several. I've never, I don't anymore. Absolutely. This is um, Galafridis? All chickens there. Yeah, I, yeah. I've kosher chickens there either, but it's. Uh... Yeah. And Every so often, I'm lucky at my local grocery store, and I see smaller chickens. I just, I just buy them when I find them. So, but, I, but you have to hunt for them. You really do. Okay, so I'm gonna... this might be there. Hmm. Want to make sure it's not the wrong side. Hang on. Give it another couple minutes. So the, the broth, I'm thinking already what I'm gonna do with it. Maybe like make some little tortellini or something. Um, is my sound breaking up a little? I don't think so. Uh, it may have been other people's sound on. Occasionally it goes in and out, but mostly it's good. Okay, good, 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 good. good. Um, so let me talk about the rest of this book. So the, the book itself is, um, I, I would argue that it's really like the first Renaissance cookbook that comes out of England. Um, there's earlier ones that are printed by Pinson in 1500, this book of cookery and a carving book, I think that's um, Wink and Word maybe. And they're, they're still completely and utterly medieval recipes. But what, what makes this one different is that there's a couple of interesting recipes that are circulating on the continent at the time that show up in this one too. So I think that this, whoever wrote this, um, had seen or knew of recipes, like for example, there's a, a dish called the uh, neve de latte, which means snow of milk that you find in uh, Messrs. Bugo and, and um, 1549. It's in uh, Jodico Willick, who is um, Swiss, and it's in um, a couple of other, uh, it's in the Livre for Excellent de Cuisine also, the, but this is a dish full of snow that he calls it. And what's really fascinating is he doesn't have a whisk. So there's, um, he takes a, a stick and cuts it forehand. And then this is, this is called the proper new book of cookery. Um, there's a modern edition by Anne Ahmed, which I would not recommend, even though it has facsimile on one side, she changes it in the, it's not a transcription. It's like an interpretation on the other. It's like, just, just leave the words as they are. They're clear enough. Anyway, the um, dish full of snow is, is uh, then pressed through a colander onto a little twig of rosemary that's stuck in an apple. So it makes this lovely little winter scene and it's delicious and it's, it's, you know, rose water. They love their rose water, I guess. So let me see if this is now ready. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, we'll just have to wait. Just, I'll just keep ch chatting. Um, the, um, and the book is really small. I actually uh, sort of printed it out and made a kind of facsimile of it. It's only like this big. So, so you can imagine someone in the kitchen holding this, uh, it would have been very cheap. So it's not you know, a courtly cookbook at all. And the proportions of the servants also suggest that it's made for family, that like this is not you know, like shikar or something that has you know, hundreds, hundreds of, uh, serving hundreds of people. This is really for a small household or an intimate you know, sort of setting. And I think what's going on in the cookbook is that there are spices in it and there's things that people of a slightly lower than nobility gentry level of society would have, so this stuff would have been available to them. Remember the Portuguese have made the you know, direct connection to India. We're picking up spices directly from there. And um, so I think this is sort of the, the elite cuisine that would have a generation before been restricted to very wealthy people is now sort of mercantile middling sorts of people can afford cinnamon and sugar and rose water and things like that. But 
why this recipe in particular doesn't have almonds. It's sort of weird. Why not? Almond milk is sort of the signature of the thing. And why it doesn't have spices is also kind of interesting. Uh, this one in particular, this, I, maybe just to keep it light color. Um, and as I suggested, maybe the rye is a miss print for rice flour, which maybe the printer said, what the hell's rice flour? <laughs> it said put in rye, which would have been familiar to them, but we'll see, see what, how it turns out um, anyway. Yeah, rice flour is used for the matmunia in the uh, Arabic recipes, which oh, is so, the original oh, source of blancmange. Right, right, right. Um, and, or, or even wheat starch, if people can, don't, do, do people know how to make wheat starch? It's really very easy. So you just take a dough of flour and water and you knead it and then continue kneading it under water. And what you have is the separation of the proteins comes out in the glob that's in your hand, which you could eat. It's great. So it's just vegetable protein, you know, textured vegetable protein, basically. But all the starch comes out into the water and sinks to the bottom of the, of the bowl. And you pour that off and you use it as thickener. It's, it's perfect. Um, so I've seen that. I've seen wheat starch sometimes called for amidon, is what they would have called it in the, in the Latin uh, texts. But rye never. <laughs> so that's... That's what's sort of weird about this. Okay, we're gonna one more shot. I think this is done. In fact, let's just let's just do it. Okay, so I'm drying it as the as the um, directions say. Let's shut that off so we get a little more quiet. Um, and um, a pair of cards. Card him as small as possible. So let's see if I can uh, dry this off as dry as possible. All right. Yeah, sure. Well, it's, you know, it's still raw in the middle, so I'm gonna start with the outside. It takes a remarkably long time to cook. I'm surprised about that. Whoosh. This is going back in. But let's see if our cards work. Could have actually cut it up into pieces to start with, couldn't I? All right. Let me just um, put this in one more second. Yep. And we shall have to dry again. Can you get me more paper towels? Okay, that was good. Now it's cooked. Up. I just dumped them in just, just so there was no raw bits on them. Okay, dry. And there. Yeah, let's see what happens. Yeah. And how do you propose we do this? So, like, yes. take a piece of chicken, put it in between, and just Shred, which it's working, it believe it or not. Kind of wow, it is absolutely shredding this. It's getting caught in there, but it's like what you're getting is this sort of chicken floss at the other end. Wow, that's really weird. Actually, it's going very quick. Wow. Can everyone see the texture of this? What's happening? It's not coming out stringy. It's really, it's just kind of coming out of this like fiber. And when you're using cards for wool uh, to get the stuff that's stuck out after you've uh, carded it, you do it backwards. Rub it, rub it the opposite direction you've been doing it. It works for wool, no idea about chicken. Yeah, it's, um, it's not coming out of this, but, but it's still shredding fine, so. Do this over the bowl. Um, I'm gonna let's do it over this. That's where it's going ultimately. Mm. So yeah. This is kind of not coming out. Well, I'm gonna give the other other set a, a shot just to see what happens. Oh wait, no, she was right. If you go against the that's coming out now. Yeah, there we go. Wow, okay, let's keep going. So the nails actually work fine too. 
It's not quite as fine, but you can see it's shredding it up very nicely. And I think this was actually just the English author's innovation. You know, he just said, rather than pick this apart with your fingers, let's us see what happens. So Sabina, how nice to see you. Gosh, it's there. You can buy at a pet store, uh, what are called dog or cat brushes that would do the job and they're plastic handled, you can just scrub them. Yeah, I saw those. And then the idea of something that was meant for dogs going on the chicken flesh seemed a little, you know, I don't know, it just seemed bizarre to me. I don't know, they uh, eat dogs in some other parts of the world. Yeah, sure. But you're saying go backwards with the thing and it will... Yeah, when you're when you're cleaning with it, you see how there's like hooks, and if you go against the grain with it, well, you can see it's it's. Well, let me show you the texture of this really fine, flossy chicken, which is really weird. Okay, so while this is happening, let's let's just finish that up, and I'll get these two pieces. This isn't going to take very long, actually. We might as well do it as long as we're here. I'm going to break it up with my fingers to start with. So let me continue with the recipe. Um, is a pottle of milk, a pottle of cream, pottle would have been two quarts, I think. So I've cut this down significantly. Um, and I'm going to put that into that pot with this stuff. Here goes the cream. This is going to be really thick and rich. That's all I can say. Here goes the milk, and I'm going to eyeball that same amount. And then sugar, which I've measured here. Carded capon, put all into a pan, stir it together on the fire. And when it beginneth to boil, add half a pound of sugar and a saucer full of rose water. And so let it boil till it be thick and put it in a charger till it be cold. And then you may slice it as you do leech and so serve it in. So a leech just means to slice like leech craft is a surgery and um, Lesh Lombard, you know, a very famous sort of dish that's uh, sliced. And they like, they like, I mean, you know this stuff, they like sliced foods uh, that, that are, you know, cold and multicolored, lots of layers, which I think is lovely. This, I'm not sure why the author went so far as to depart from this, from the standard so much that he made a lesh out of it, but I've never, I don't think I've seen anywhere else. And just pulling this apart. It's hot as hell, okay. If you have any other questions while we're doing this, go, go ahead and shoot. Uh, we had a question in the chat, will these recipes be offered somewhere? Offered somewhere. So you know what I'm going to do, folks? I'm obviously not going to have enough time to let that. But I think what I'll do is I'll post them on my Facebook page. So um, there is there, there is a published version um, of the later edition. I think, um, yeah, 1557, which someone just put there. It's 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 the same text, really, um, that you can find online. And there's the edition of An Ahmed. But I will actually post this on my Facebook page um, with the recipe uh, and the transcription and yeah, it'll be fine. Um, the other one, I don't, I, I trans, hand transcribe, but I'll type it out. It's, it's, it's simple, but that is one that you probably wouldn't be able to find unless it's, a, it's at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. Um, I called manuscript 500, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is typically the way that I have always done a homage is to shred it like this, you know, just shred it very finely. Platina has a recipe in, in that's like that which obviously he's gotten from Martino and that ultimately comes, I think from Rupert of Nola. It's actually a, a, a Catalan of La Manche. Um, <laughs> we're getting covered in chicken here. <laughs> Very funny. Okay, so the, the carding I think is slightly absurd. So you know what we're gonna do? I'm just gonna chuck all this stuff and shred it up and it's gonna fall apart when it cooks, right? So we, we proved that carding works. We just don't have the patience to do it. <laughs> um, would a process, food processor, a super fine 
food processor. A food processor probably would do exactly what they're, they're looking for. But let's take a look at the cakes. They're, um, they're not there yet, but they look kind of good. Um, I'll show you them in just a second. Um, okay, let's just, let's skip this on there. Let me heat that up. Um, stir it together and set on fire. When it begins to boil is when we add the sugar and other stuff. And I'm gonna put all this shredded chicken in there, shredded cake on there. It by hand is much, much easier. Crazy. I'm trying to think of the poor housewife who's doing this with two of her cards from, from carding wool. And she's in there in the kitchen trying to make the finest little shred of, of capon for the family. It's like, now that's drudgery. That really is. And this is, and this is only a, like a half of the recipe too. So you the whole capon. I'm imagining this would take you a very long time indeed. Um, so, you know, the other weird anomaly is this doesn't say salt anywhere. Um, I don't know whether it should be, but uh, okay, someone's giving some proportions there. Um, and I think this will, this will be good. Yeah. Not so finely colored. So, you know, someone, I was cooking this recipe in, um, an Italian version in Rome uh, in a workshop a few years ago. And the people were just overjoyed and terrified at the idea of a chicken pudding, which is kind of what it is. And I said, well, close your eyes and think, where have you tasted something that is very much like this? Very smooth, fine chicken, sweetened, and you know, kind of appealing to tastes what children would like. And I said, just now think of a chicken McNugget. <laughs> It's very similar um, in the overall aesthetic effect you know, because it's it's not really a pudding, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, okay. Let's uh, okay. So that's beginning to boil. But I'm dumping it all in. With apologies to the author, lack of patience. And this one. Okay, it's beginning to boil. You can see that. And I'm going to add the sugar. It's not a great deal, actually. You know, it's not it's not actually overwhelmingly sweet. And I'm going to add the rye flour, and this is going to bring the whole thing together. It doesn't say how long to cook this but uh, till it be very thick. Okay, let's just, let's just let that go. Now the question is, do I add salt or do I not? Um, I don't know, it uh, sure couldn't hurt. I don't think this salt called for it anything there. Does that mean it's not there? I'm gonna use it just because otherwise it's gonna be. Very bland. <clears throat> well, you, can, you can see in the pot. Yeah, it's 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 thickening up nicely. Actually. Is there anything else? Nope, that's it. So again, what I'll do is I will let this um, solidify. I'm going to put it into this mold right here. Let it chill, and probably later on this afternoon, I'll post it on Facebook and give you the recipe and tell you whether it's worth eating. <laughs> I don't know if it is with dry flour. But it looks kind of good now. I don't know. I'm tempted to taste it. That's actually really, really good. It's, you know, it's clean. How bad can it be, right? It reminds me of chicken a la king. I don't know whether you've ever had, you know, the stuff that they put on toast. It's like really creamy, sweet chicken. If I, if I drop some like peas and carrots in here and put it on a slice of American, you know, white bread, you'd think, oh, that's good, <laughs> good stuff. Um, so any questions, shoot. And I'm, I'm gonna pull the stuff out of the, uh, out of the oven in just a minute.
and maybe wash my hands. I am myself carded. I did have a question. Go ahead. What was the temperature that you put the cakes in the oven at? The temperature that I put the oven at? Um, yeah. I 325 and I lowered it to 300 to okay. replicate. So right. it's a low. Okay. Um, th there's no temperature. And, uh, that's a, just a complete random guess. Right. That's why I was asking. I was wondering what your guess was at because I, I would figure 325 as well, but I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of cookies basically, right? Right, right. Um, did I add the rose water to this? You know, thank you. Damn it. Yes. A, um, a couple of spoons of rose water. Did I say that? Um, a saucer full of rose water. So no, that's more than that. Um, no, let's use, pretend this is a saucer. Thank you, I almost missed that. So let's just say there's an eighth of a cup maybe. Thank you, someone. That would have been key. Okay, let me take this stuff out. These look just delicious. They're um, the, they're little, slightly brown. Um, they don't look like pound cake so much because they're a little darker. But I'm gonna try and pull one out and taste it. Mm, okay. it smells like a muffin. It does smell like a buttery muffin, sort of. The sugar did exactly what I guess they wanted it to. It became like sort of crinkly on top, and Smells great. I mean, how bad could that be? Okay, this is uh, coming together. Is it very thick? Almost. Well, sir. Chicken pudding. What's for dinner, Mom? Chicken pudding. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, you have to admit. Um, now, the question is, why did chicken go out of this dish? Like, why was it such a standard? and then becomes dessert and the chicken disappears. And I think it, it's, it's one of the casualties of the separation of sweet and savory foods that happens in the course of the 17th century, you know, with classical French cuisine, they just sort of banish these strange concoctions. Well, they're not strange, they're perfectly ordinary. The rest of the world still does it, right? I mean, you, you use sugar in so many other cuisines routinely. In Western cuisine, it gets pushed to the end of a meal or use very, very sparingly. You never see it in a, in a main dish. Right? So I think this is probably almost there. It's, it's looking beautifully thick. And I think this will probably set. I'll just do another minute. I don't want to burn it, obviously, but. Um, and the, the shreds did, as I predicted, just come apart fine. They're this, I, don't, I don't know whether we really needed to card this. Um, Every other recipe says to pull up with your fingers. So, should we taste? Intriguing and lovely and beautiful. Um, like really nice. Surprisingly nice. Delicious. Beautifully balanced between yep. the, the sugar and um, creaminess. Yeah, we're not serving this to anyone else, so you don't need to worry about <laughs> you tasting the spoon, right? And I think cold, the flavors are going to be a little more muted also. Um, I don't know, I'm thinking of like maybe slicing, frying up those slices. Doesn't that sound good? Um, okay, so maybe I'll feed this to my grandchildren. I bet they'll eat it. Okay, so going in there, and if I've measured correctly, I should. It did measure correctly. Oh. Come up to the top of that. Close. Good enough. Ouch. See that lovely. Um, it's not brown. It's white still, it's still a blancmange. Um, just a slightly off color from the rye. 
Maybe if I'd use the lighter rod, it would be different. I'm just a bit chill. Um, let me try and get one of these guys out. Okie dokie, artichokey. I don't know if you can see that, but it's cake. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. No, no surprise with that. I think I'll let them cool, but we want to taste it now as long as we're here. Uh, boy, that butter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. It's not pound cake. Not at all. It's like just this really lovely, it's closer to a muffin. Totally. Yeah. It's like a really buttery muffin with, um, Raisins and a, a crazy amount of right? raisins. Yeah, raisins kind of dominate the whole thing, which is fine. So, do you have any questions? I'm. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. So, if you have other questions, I'll post both of these recipes. Mm. I wish I could share this with you because <laughs> I like them a lot. Talk about butter. Wow, they'll they'll get more solid, I think, when they cool off. But. If you have questions, shoot. So I had one based on something based on what you something you said earlier in your presentation about the Portuguese doing a lot of pastries and you mentioned puff pastry. So I where would I find that a recipe for puff pastry in a, med, a medieval one? Well, they don't use that word. Um, mm -hmm. I probably not until the 19th century, but but the one that call that comes to mind first is um is Messes Bugo. He's got a pastry that's rolled out as thin as possible, made into layers and uh, sprinkled with sugar. And then the layers are, are basted with butter and baked. So it's not a phyllo dough, but it's, but it's not a, it's not laminated in the way that you put it in the fridge and roll it out and put it in the fridge and roll it out over and over again. But it's definitely a flaky pastry and he calls it a pizza. <laughs> it's just like, okay, why not? You know, that pizza just needs a little pinch, I guess is where the, where the word comes from. But, um, but there's things, see, here's the thing. I think in food history, people often say, we want to know the origin of this dish. Where was it invented? Where did it come from? And that's not the way cooking works. It really kind of evolves slowly. Like language, you can't say, where does English begin? Well, I don't know, there's Old English, there's Anglo-Saxon, there's Middle English. It's always this constant, constant sort of reevaluating, changing ingredients or techniques or, uh, equipment based on on convenience and need and to say you know where's the first one of these there's a couple of dishes you can say that with but like is there an origin for pizza or hamburgers absolutely not you know there have been things like those for a long time you can say when the word is first invented or where the where the you know term first when it first becomes popular or it first appears in, pr in print but cuisine you know especially pastries are all over the place all the time and there are ancestors of things we know, and some of them, you know, just sort of change over time. Does that make sense? So someone is saying there's a it Spanish- It makes sense. Yeah, so if you know um, both Maceras and Martinez Motinho, and those of you who are interested in Spanish, I know it's slightly after, you guys cover it 1611, heaven for fem, 17th century. But he's, um, he's a, it's a great cookbook. It's, it's a, called The Art of Cooking and Pastry Making and Biscocheria, making biscuits, um, but this has been um, just translated, and I'm—I think I'm the only person who's seen the translation so far because I'm reading it for the publisher. But is that great. Carolyn's translation? Is it finally ready? Uh, yeah, Carolyn, well, Carolyn like, Natos. It will be <laughs> going to print. It's it's Yay. magnificent, and she, and you know it is. I think one of the most important cookbooks, and for it not to have been translated up until now, is amazing um but man you want you talk about pastry making it's it's there's dozens of recipes in there anything else uh thank you for that yeah you know i wish someone would translate mrs bugo also that's that i've seen attempts to do it that haven't worked worked out um and you know there's a lot of cookbooks that still need better translations that um I think all the Latin ones could be retranslated. Uh, you know, the early Liber de Cocorum and those. Um, 
definitely the Spanish ones. There is there is the um, the Liber de Senso V was translated, but I think there's there's other ones. Uh, Rupert of Nolan who translated too, which would be great. Any other questions? There Anyone? is a translation of Mrs. Bugo. It just hasn't been published. A translation of what? Mrs. Bugo. Ariane Helu has done a translation, but I don't. I think she eventually would like to publish it, so she hasn't released it. Oh. So has Charles Potter. He's also done a translation of Messi Brugo. Yeah, the piece is floating around here, and someone whose name is now totally escaping me um, had an, a, a decent translation, I thought, and sent it to Prospect Books, and they said, "No, we're not interested." I'm like, why? You do this is what you do. You're the only people who do it. But um, I don't know that. One. Rob, uh, yeah, Robin Carroll Mann did a, a, a NOLA translation that's available online. She's here in your class right now, actually. Right, cool. Okay. Fun, fun. Do you have any other questions about these cookbooks or the stuff that we made or relate your experience maybe of making similar dishes? Ken, with the medicinal cookbook that you saw, are you noticing much sort of difference in terms of how, like the the different approaches between regions sort of like, or is it sort of seeing just a fairly common approach as ideas go around Europe? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know where exactly those recipes came from. My guess is they were copied from somewhere else. And I wouldn't be surprised to find this Portugal cakes in a, in a cookbook somewhere else. I just haven't looked. Um, cause they're, cause they're commonplace books. And it was clear that the, the original author had just left spaces in there and someone found it and said, Oh, I want this recipe, but didn't own the book, I guess, and copied it down or heard it from someone. There's no attribution in it, but they filled every single space that was left in the book with another recipe, whether it was relevant or not. And that's, that's kind of typical for these. Um, I would say if you're interested in those kind of manuscript cookbooks, the, um, Folger has a lot that are online that are that are 16th, 17th century mostly. There's a few 18th century ones, but they're really nice. They're fun to play with. Um, the one that I've um, cooked from extensively is by Lettuce Pudsey. <laughs> you just gotta love that name. Um, she's, uh, I think, early 17th century, but but really they're fun recipes and, and um, I've had fun cooking them. But you know, the medieval manuscript books are, are there's not that many of them. That, and most of them have at least been transcribed, and if not printed. Um, well, I tell you what, I'm, I, I'm through. So uh, let me say goodbye to all of you. And um, I will again publish, I will put these in Facebook and share them to various sites, you know, historic cooking sites if you're on there. And, um, and thank you all for coming. It's very nice to see everyone. And thank you, Ken. You, this is great. Thank you. Always, I want to come over thank and you, chat. You always look like you're having so much fun. Well, okay, have to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and stopping the recording.